Hey folks, this is the second part of our chat with Ben Sherman about SwiftUI and migrating to SwiftUI and his work that he does at Nike. I hope you enjoy this and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Two in the show notes so people can look that up. Yeah. Um, one thing, one elephant in the room we haven't talked about and you kind of just briefly mentioned it uh, is your data. Um, You've got like 32 choices of how you can have your data hooked up to Swift UI. And on top of that, mm -hmm. you have to work with UI kit. Um, how are you doing it? Like, are you still doing observed object? You still using combine? Are you migrating to observable? So we yeah. can't use observable yet because we need to support Iowa 16. Right. Uh, right. Observable is actually fantastic. And I'm looking forward to forward to being able to do that. In the year um, 2026, probably, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess next year we can, but we got to oh, okay. move forward. So okay. uh, uh, there's also the Perceptible Library by Point Free, uh, and that is a backport. <laughs> of course, Point Free. <laughs> yeah, that is a backport of the observation framework that works in iOS uh, 16. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, or maybe even 15. I can't remember what. But okay. basically, it's, it does the exact same thing. Um it's it's not uh, rocket science. Like you can go look at the source code. It's it's not too terrible uh, to understand. Um, but side you know side problem is that we currently are not yet on Swift Package Manager, so we can't uh, pull in libraries like that just yet. Uh, and so okay. and so we're kind of in this like stuck place where we 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 would like to be able to adopt uh, libraries like that, but can't. Um, so with the observable objects, I guess that the primary reason why observable object versus observable uh, is that when you, when you observe an observable object, you're observing every single property. So if you do that at the root of your app, and <coughs> anything in that changes, it triggers like a reflow of all the views inside of that. Unless that you mark be... it as observed ignored on purpose. Yes. Uh, yeah, but like the observation framework just makes this a non-issue because it's just whatever you access in the view. So if you just own the object and you're passing it on to children, you don't need to re-render when uh, mm -hmm. when that happens. And and you can you can stuff it in the environment and like four layers deep, it can pull it out again. And then the, at that layer, it observes. Yeah. Those are the views that are going to get re-rendered. So that's you know that's why it's important. Um, but we we use an observable uh, object um, currently called a model that we use for each one of our views. Okay. That model is is I hate to use the term view model because this is like overloaded. But like, uh, <laughs> as long as you know what the role of that thing is, uh, you know, call it what you want. Uh, I think the term model for if it's ex like it's a, it's nested inside of our view type. So it's obvious that this is the model for this view. Yep. And that lets us pull in dependencies, uh, handle all of the, any kind of action that happens from a button click or whatever gets routed to the model because we want to yep. be able to call these during tests, right? You yeah. should be able to test the model without touching the view. Yep. And then um, we have a pretty complicated dependency graph. And I don't want to, I don't want to send the entire world into these models. I want something really light and focused so that these yep. things can be dead simple. Like I need to fetch this thing and get back some results. And so if that dependency that, that we were calling is a little bit uh, obtuse or, you know, it doesn't fit, doesn't quite fit the need then, or maybe it requires two other dependencies to actually do the work. Cause it needs to pull in data from here and then consult this list over here in order to return the right set of data. Yeah. I will hide all that stuff in a closure and that closure becomes the, the, the new dependency. So oh, this that's is going to awesome. be like a, like a, I'm trying to think of a, an example. Um, this is your orders loader, which will just give you orders, right? It doesn't need to consult. Oh, I need to get information from this orders API. Then I need to get images for the products over here or whatever. And then I need to check to see if this thing was a, whatever it is um you can marry those things in a way that uh that you encapsulate all that logic in a closure and just pass that closure to the model so that it knows how to fetch data 
And that way your view isn't really doing anything <coughs> inter interesting. Right. Right. Uh, it, you know, you sort of separated responsibilities in that way. And you can, of course, t test all these things, uh, but it becomes trivial now for our previews because I can now override that dependency just by providing a new closure that just returns yep. a single item, returns yeah. two items, returns no items, so I can test empty view states. Yep, yep. Uh, and that's another thing we haven't really talked about, but previews are a huge superpower that I... Um, I wish more people uh, were as bad as I am. I think a lot of people just abandon previews because they're kind of uh, kind of hard. You know, they're hard to do right, especially in a big app. Um, yeah, I mean, I've had issues with just like previews not compiling properly and not working. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just had to, like, I don't want to abandon them because I want to quickly see stuff. And if I do want to use previews, what I've ended up doing at this point is like, I use the preview in a new app that's a test app, right? And be like, okay, I want it to look like this. And then I yeah. copy that over to my application. Yeah. I So I, I am of the opinion that like every component and then every list of that component or whatever, like should have a preview that contains all the states and dark mode, yeah. light mode, dynamic type or whatever. Um, empty states, <coughs> error states, you know, like... If you look at a um, design library from, you know, a web, like a, like for instance, like Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever, uh, Airbnb. I'm just trying to think of like large organizations are going to have like a, like a style right. guide, like a yeah. book. Basically, you can go in and be like, here's typography. Here's all the different things you can do, and here's when you should use them. And these are live examples. They render right there, and this is easy to do in the browser because you're already in the browser. Right. <laughs> like yeah. if these things are in HTML and CSS and JavaScript, well, they can just run it right there. Right. Uh, and so here are all our buttons. Here's how you can use them. Here's all how they respond to hover and clicked and disabled states and all that stuff. To me, yeah, exactly. like the playgrounds, not playgrounds, uh, the previews are our way of doing that in the best way possible so that you, so that we can see something that see how it works. We can interact with it. Um, and, I would say 90% of my work for that uh, collection view component I, I talked about, 90% of that was done iterating on a preview in a single file. And now they're, at least for the last couple of years, they're agnostic as far as whether you use Swift UI or UI code. So that's a big They always were. There. They always, they were? always were. Yeah. Okay. You, you just wrap it, your UI view controller in a representable and you're done. Yeah. Yeah. It was okay. just now the preview macro just does this for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so going back to the data binary, so are you, yeah. you're using observed object, right? Mm -hmm. And then are you using combine underneath? So we use combine where it makes sense and we use async await for uh, where it makes sense. And, and okay. I, I've talked about this before where I, I, I think um, uh, John Sandell's podcast, we talked about mixing Swift UI or sorry, mixing async await and combine and like when to use one, should we ditch combine? Yeah. Combine's days, I guess, are numbered, but I mean, you know how hard it is to deprecate a framework in Apple land and like make it go away. Yeah. Um, there are just certain things that I just feel like Combine is just, it's just easier to read and write. And yeah, uh, some things that async await make, so, make things way easier. And so, uh, so we're still writing new code that uses Combine. Uh, we're still mixing that sometimes with async await. I still don't really think in async streams. So there's very few of that type of async stream type of yeah. um, thing. I feel like a a for await loop that just runs forever seems weird to me. Yes, it does seem weird. Yes, one hundred percent. I just wrapped uh, my I just created my first async stream. Um and it's like it made sense in that case, but what I've found is anything that's like one of those built in publishers, like a timer or like a yeah. notification center or even key value stuff, key value yeah. observing. It's just like so much easier to do it in combine. And like you said, it's yeah. just easier to think in combine as opposed to this weird. I'm glad async algorithms is a thing now. And I hope that yeah. that sort of continues. Uh, so they have things like debounce, which I was like, how would you even write that? That to me that I was trying to think of like, you know, how it, how it would be written. And that's just a different style than, than uh, writing uh, operators in, in combine. 
Um, but I will say that this is probably my own just experience uh, and comfort level with Combine. I was a holdout on all the reactive programming stuff because I found it to be confusing. And then I okay. really dug into it. And I then I was like, I need to make a course about it, this. So that's where the Combine Swift course came from. And so now I feel very, very comfortable in Combine. So that's probably part of the reason why I'm like not afraid to keep using it. Um, yeah, I I have a new app and I still... I have a couple of spots where there's combined and then everything else is observable basically. Um, mm -hmm. And that's like, I feel like observable was a thing that's like, okay, now I don't need to combine, even though I love it. Um, it like makes a lot more sense. So yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Um, yeah. So the, so the data piece, um, our app is mostly read only. So that is, you know, when you have an app that is taking in data, um, you know, I, I have, well, uh, I don't say, you place an order? Like you can't. Yeah, but that's from my perspective. That's a button click, and then another team handles that whole thing, right? So, like, okay. so yes, you know, we could write that, but that's you know, luckily it's it's not the e-commerce part of it is not our responsibility, right? Right. Um, but like, say tonal therapy. This is like the easiest example I could I could uh, uh, c come up with because it's like the only app that is like kind of standalone. It doesn't take data from the internet and display it like 90% of the apps. Uh, right. This one, you know, you enter in a uh, frequency of like a tinnitus frequency that you can hear, and then this will like play a pattern. And so, um, you know, this is essentially a slider that's connected to a text box so that, and which is connected to the model. And so whether or not you adjust the slider or type in a value in the text box, they both end up sort of flowing to the model and then the model reacts to generate a new sequence. Right, of, right. of tones. And so, um, yeah, that two way binding, it definitely, you know, still works. And in, if you need to marry that with an existing architecture that wasn't built with these tools, um, you, uh, I, I feel like having bindings for the model so that you know when it changed and then glue that to however else you would have updated your own internal model. And I think it's, it's okay to not ha to like break your part your model up into smaller pieces so that it's not just one giant thing that has to serve both roles but you can have like some glue that you pass to swift ui to make the swift ui call site really nice and clean and then you glue those two things together with bindings or subscribing to the value using combine or async await or the observation framework um is there anything else you want to talk about when it comes to the Interfacing between UI kit and Swift UI. There's one thing that, okay. uh, so I mentioned that we started, uh, on this process of, uh, sort of changing out our lists. So I had to create this collection view component. And, and I also mentioned that one of the early things we did to try to get some stuff working in Swift UI was wrap some existing UI kit components in Swift UI. Okay. Sorry. UI kit components in Swift UI. So, so using NS or UI view controller representable to wrap yep. an existing, uh, component is essentially a button, but underneath that is tons and tons of valuable logic that we don't want to, uh, mess up. Right. And so just wrap that in Swift UI. Now the call site is really easy. It's, we can use it in our Swift UI views directly. That happened to be a component that needed to be used inside of a cell and UI hosting controller that I mentioned was really nice that you could just plop in a Swift UI view. Yeah. That one will give you a fat warning if you do this. If you have a, so we're, so we're going from UI kit collection view. Is this a runtime to, warning, I assume? Yeah, runtime okay. warning. Uh, you're going from a UI kit world, which is a collection view, to Swift UI, which is the hosting configuration view. And inside of that view, you have a UI view controller representable, it will fail, right? It'll runtime give you a warning. This is an unsupported configuration and it will not render that view. Okay. Um, the reason is, is because view, view controllers have to, they have a, an invariant that you have to satisfy, which is that they have a parent view controller or they're part of the view controller hierarchy. And that's how things like safe area insets and, uh, trait changes and, um, uh, you know, sizing, uh, changes and stuff like that. View did a fear view will disappear. All the, all those things flow through the parent child view controller hierarchy. And by okay. putting a swift UI 
uh, wrapper around a view controller inside of Swift UI view, and then putting that in a UI view controller. Now you've broken that link. Chain. Like that little component doesn't have a reference to a parent anywhere. Yeah. And so uh, I I was running full speed with this collection thing, and uh, hit a brick wall with this one. <laughs> And I was like, oh, no. Uh, and, uh, and it ended up uh, that I could sort of sidestep this process and think, like, well, how did Apple implement UI hosting controller? Because it's – or, sorry, UI hosting configuration because it's right. fast. That was the other thing that I was worried about is, that, like, the uh, UI hosting view has a generic of a root view. Uh, UI hosting controller, sorry. Has a generic of that root view. And if you and it's mutable, so you can swap out that view for another one, and that's what UI hosting configuration does by the cell. So it's just okay. it's keeping that same space reserved. There's only one UI view in there, so you're not like constantly creating new UI views and then deallocating them as you scroll. Right, it's one yeah. of those. But then you swap swap in and out the, the Swift UI content, and that is really fast. Um, so I went one step farther, created my own custom cell that embeds a UI hosting controller of a known view type. And then that one has a method on it where I can set its parent so that I know I have a way to set the parent view controller of that UI hosting controller. Uh, this is kind of hard to say on podcast form, but <laughs> <laughs> so, so I sort of thought about like how, how did Apple implement UI hosting configuration? Like they're, they're using UI collection view cell, so like they're probably using UI hosting controller. So I went that route and did it manually and I was able to set that parent view controller uh, manually. And it wasn't, it was a, probably a dozen lines of code to get this done. Nice. And so it was, so that is something um, people should watch out for is yeah. if they break the hierarchy. Yeah. You're, it's not going to work essentially. Yeah. And it, like when I map this <clears> out, I'm like, Oh man, we're going UI kit to Swift UI to UI kit to Swift UI to UI kit to Swift UI to UI kit. Like, and it does work, but you got to be aware of all these layers because uh, the way that Swift UI does sizing and layout is different from the way that UI yeah. Kit does, and yeah. and those Swift UI doesn't care about your auto layout constraints. Yeah, um, we had that whole chat your... with Chris a few weeks ago. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah I get this it. has taken me a long time to uh, to internalize, but I will say like the the little tidbit that has helped is. Uh, if you have an intrinsic content size for a view or a preferred content size for a view controller, uh, if you say dot fixed size on the Swift UI wrapper, it will adhere to that size as if it were the ideal size of that component. And that so, has saved my bacon a bunch because I was like, <laughs> how do I get this to know how big the Swift UI, or how big the UI kit thing is? And the answer is intrinsic content size for views, preferred content size for controllers and then use the dot fixed size uh, modifier on the Swift UI side. We had one question from Swift Dev UI on Twitter. Um, when using built-in views, for example, a CN contact view controller or an EK event view controller in Swift UI, is there a way to have the toolbar showing without wrapping set controller in a UI navigation controller? Uh, I know the easiest solution is to put it in a sheet, which is then, which isn't, which, which then it's just a UI navigation controller without a UI Swift UI navigation. But I'm wondering if there's a way to do it without using a sheet. Um, if you wrap it in a UI view contr navigation controller, it's already in Swift UI navigation sec. It will show two navigation bars. Uh, if you don't wrap it in a UI navigation controller, it won't show the edit button. Do you know what this situation is uh, exactly? So I, the double navigation controller bar, obviously, we want to avoid. I guess the question is, is the component, is Apple's component coming with its own navigation controller, or does it expect right. you to embed in your own? And uh, the so the, the two that were mentioned were the contact picker, and what was the other one? The event view controller <clears throat> for uh, event kit. For, like, calendar? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would... These are both, these both predate Swift UI, the contact one by a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would, uh, I would not, I, w I would just try to like make that controller happy in whatever way made sense for that controller, which probably means plain UI kit navigation controller in a sheet. If you, 
I also think that that those things are generally modal in behavior anyway. You like you right. go there to do a thing and then you dismiss it and now you're back. It in should be a sh- it should be like a little pop up sheet. Like that's the way I would think about it. I I don't think you would ever want to push this on your own navigation stack. Yeah, that seems like a an awkward flow to me. Yep. Of like, oh, I fill out some details and now I click next and now like next horizontally in that hierarchy is Apple's UI for picking a contact. That seems strange to me. Yeah, one hundred percent. I agree. Yeah. Um, I had one. I had one other topic I wanted to cover. Now that you're here, um, we talked about Swift Package Manager. Um, what is stopping you from using that? I guess at Nike. Uh, there's probably too many internal details to <laughs> to discuss. Uh, large companies move slowly, right? We have a lot. No, no, of, no, I get it. A lot of projects, and so. Um, yeah, it's it's um, it's. Is it on the goal post? Is it a goal? Yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah we okay. actually hit a blocker. We we were going to do it last year, and we hit a major blocker, and have engaged Apple and <clears> trying <throat> to figure that out. But yeah, it's I don't know. Like big companies do things in unique ways. I think sometimes, and sometimes that doesn't match the ideal path that most people would encounter. So I don't think most people would even be aware of the problem that we run into. So. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So, uh, one thing that you helped me on was introducing me to sub reap, uh, sub repo. Right. Um, and that was a big benefit. I'm right now in the middle of a rewrite of one of my packages. Um, but do you think the situation has improved with developing simultaneous package development when you have like dependencies and stuff? Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) No, I don't think it's improved at all. Uh, so, so maybe some context for the, the listeners. You either do mono repo, which is everything that your company develops, all your packages and everything are in your own repo. Uh, you can still do third-party stuff that comes in externally, but if you want to iterate on those components while you're building a thing, which is what we most most of the time we do. Mm-hmm. Um, then, then having them in one re- repo is actually kind of nice, and it. Um, it, it's not even my preference. I just think that there are benefits, right? So like the, the, the alternative is like every component that you have has a separate GitHub repo or get, get repository somewhere, uh, yeah, yeah. maybe on GitHub and then well, you pull it in, I'm a, you pull I'm it in either by. T- I was just going to say, I'm specifically talking about like a Swift, like an open source project you wanted to publish. Um, that's mostly the case that I'm looking at right but now. It has other packages that are part of that. Yeah, it has yeah. like third, like park, like you want a different plugin, for instance. Yeah, and whether those are hosted in the same repo or or in separate repos, right? Right, right. But it's even like if hard to publish sep- it. If you, it would be even yeah. harder to publish it like as a mono repo. So, for instance, in my case, um, I have a I'm working on sublimation, which is my package for um, allowing people to auto de- like if you have a iPhone, you want it to auto detect your vapor server um it, you could either advertise it via ngrok and some sort of key value pair on the cloud mm-hmm. or you could use bonjour and advertise it that way so like there's separate packages for that um okay. that's that's the current example that i'm running into right now so right now it's actually a mono repo and then i'm going to split them off into like in development like not active like not advertised yet but like <clears throat> it's in a mono repo and then the plan is to take those directories and put them out into separate repos um mm-hmm. once i know that everything works works well together yeah yeah i think that that so like if you wanted to iterate on all those things but keep them in separate repos then you could do a local checkout you could tell your package manager the swift package manager that i have a local package instead of a remote one yep that's what right, i'm doing iterate that way um in the Cocoa Pods way, if anything in your pod file referenced a local path, it would be grouped up under development dependencies and sim linked to those folders in your Xcode project. Uh, so when okay. so you could just you could just edit them directly, and when you're done, you push it, you tag it, you change your pod file reference to point to the tag version, and you're done. Yeah, it was actually a pretty nice story. In in uh, Swift Package Manager, it is a little bit more cumbersome to do that, I think, and I. I haven't like I use Swift Package Manager on basically every project I do, but it's 
all of those are tiny in comparison to what to what I'm working on at, at Nike. But Nike, yeah. Um, there are certain things that I have heard have been problematic on larger projects, like editing, of creating a local version of a transitive dependency. So say you have got, I have dependency A, but A, a depends on dependency B, which I want to work on. And so pulling in dependency B locally, when you resolve A, you need Swift Package Manager to also resolve B yeah. uh, as a local package so that, so that it all stitches together correctly. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's solved yet. I um, Then there's the, uh, the other problem of like Xcode decides to resolve packages when it wants to. Mm -hmm. um, again, I know this is improving, but if you've got a bunch of packages... Uh, and then you get on a plane and open up a project <laughs> like it's going to like lock up your editor while it's like trying to resolve packages. And I, I kind of prefer the approach of, uh, of Cocoa Pods where you're like manually saying I'm ready to pod install here. And at that point you've yeah. got a copy of the, the code twist is actually a, a project that I'm really interested in. Um, yeah, I've had Peter on here talking about twist and I feel like, okay. Um, yeah, they that, do the they do the packages stuff. in the way that I would want to do it, where you you have a command to resolve the packages. It does it with Swift Package Manager, but gives you a local checkout. And then when you integrate with Twist, it uses that local version. Yep. Yeah. Completely. Anything else, Ben? You want to talk about before we close out? Oh, I could talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you have left? Um, <laughs> Did you still want to chat about this wonderful studio that I'm about to tear down? If you want to, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's end it right here as far as the podcast episode, and then we can record a separate thing, and I'll post a link to that in the show notes. Um, ben, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was a really great conversation. Appreciate it. Where can people find you online? Uh, you can find my uh, website at bensherman.com. Uh, that will have links to NS Screencast and Combine Swift and some of the other apps I work on. Uh, and I'm on Mastodon at Ben S at Mastodon.xyz. Awesome. People can find me on Twitter at Leo G. Dion, um, at Leo G. Dion at C.im on Mastodon. Um, if you want to come on, uh, let me know. I'd love to have you on as a guest. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. That way we can let more people know about this podcast. Um, and of course, you're listening. Review would be uh, great as well on your podcast player. Thank you so much. And...